Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to, to our session today. Uh, obviously, we're here to talk about some of the work that we've been working on it for Hive, um, although, of course, it'll be applicable to other projects eventually. Um, so I'm Owen O'Malley, uh, and this is Eric Hansen. Eric Hansen's from Microsoft, and um, I've been doing a lot of the work on Orc, and he's been doing a lot of the work on vectorization, although there's a lot of people doing both. Okay, so the history of, of storage in Hive. Of course, originally we had text and sequence file because those came from MapReduce, and they worked, but they had some properties that, that were unfortunate. The first one, of course, is that even if you only needed one of the columns out of the data, you had to load up the whole thing. And so to fix that, um, Facebook came up with RC file and our C file did a really good job. It treated each column um, as a separate piece, and so it stored them all together. And that let you read just the bytes that you needed to read to get the column. So that worked great. It compressed the bytes separately so that you could de just decompress the pieces you needed. And um, they also added one more feature, which um, was to do lazy deserialization, so that if you had a predicate that meant that you only needed to look at some of the, the rows, it would wait to, look, to decompress the rest of the, the row until you'd figured out that you needed it. Okay, so that was good. That helped things a lot. It made things run very fast. Um, but there were some remaining challenges. The first was that our C file just treats everything as a binary blob. It treats each column as a set of bytes and it doesn't know anything about the bytes. It can't do anything tricky with it because it just doesn't know. It doesn't know whether this is an integer or a string or what the representation is. Now, some people will say that, oh, it just does text format. That actually is the, the default, but there is actually a binary format too, so you don't need to have um, the text format in there. But because it doesn't understand the types, there's no way for it to build an index. Every, Thing is just a binary blob, it can't interpret it, it doesn't know what the values are, it just has to, to read it as it goes. The other thing is that Hive has these complex types, which is great, right? You have these structs, lists, maps, you've got all these features that are available, but Hive, the RC file just stores it um, as a big binary blob, and so even if you only need a piece of that complex column, you end up reading and decompressing the whole blob, um, which is pretty unfortunate. Um, another problem is that seeking to the, the start of your map input split, you have to scan byte by byte. There's no way to jump to where you needed to go, and that actually was showing up as a measurable amount of time in MapReduce and Hive processing. Um, so we needed to improve that, and um, furthermore, the compression was done using stream-based, which meant that if you needed any of those values, everything in the row group up to that point. So just for the column, but you still needed to decompress it. The metadata was added at the beginning of the file. That seems reasonable. You think about file headers most often. But with HDFS, of course, you can only write at the end of the file. You can't ever rewrite the front. So that meant if you were trying to accumulate data about what had been written in the file, you had to, you couldn't do it with RC file it, because the file um, made you store it at the front and then put the data. And finally, de lazy deserialization is very, very slow. Okay, so we had two primary goals. We wanted to improve query speed and improve the storage efficiency. Um, and of course those two are related, right? By decreasing the size, you can um, improve the, the performance, but they are actually independent goals. Uh, we wanted to support the whole high unions. We wanted to be able to support the whole, the whole thing, including the new primitive types of date, time, and decimal. So it's important that we map down into all of those because we wanted this to become the, the default format for Hive so that it will just replace our C file. <clears throat> One of the features of Hive is that it has its own output commit logic, and 
So having a single file come as output makes the integration with Hive much, much easier. And as, um, as you integrate with Hive, if you've got multiple files, both your logic gets very tricky and you become very, very dependent on which version of Hive you're working with. So I wanted to avoid that. A side benefit, of course, is that um, you don't have to worry about block placement. The block placement just works because it's a single file. And you also have much less pressure on the name node, right? Name nodes have a maximum number of files that they can handle because everything's stored in RAM. And so I wanted to keep that pressure as low as possible. Of course, um, one of the characteristics is that you had to bound how much memory you use for, for writing these things. Okay, so given those as requirements, um, I wanted to, to break things up. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could bound them out of memory, so I broke the file into stripes. Uh, each stripe consists of a whole set of rows, and the default stripe size is 256 MB. Now that compares to 4 MB for our C file, and the reason that I made that so much larger is precisely because as you read the file, let's say you're just reading two columns. With 4 MB, each of those columns is only 40K. That's a very, very small read for HDFS. You wanna make that, that noticeably larger. And so by making the, the columns 200, or the stripes 256 MB, then you'll get 2 MB on average and, and you'll get a much more efficient read. I also put in a footer. The footer has the metadata for the whole file, which includes the types, it includes where each stripe is located. That gets rid of the, the characteristic where you have to seek through the file to try and find where the data is. So you can just jump to right, right to where you go. Um, it also has some metadata about the, the data. Because I understand that this is an integer column or a string column, I can keep the min, the max, I can keep the sum, for integer, or in real columns, obviously. Um, and that will enable us in the future to make Hive do much better about um, answering questions like count star. I don't know how many of you have used Hive and been completely frustrated that count star launches a MapReduce job. That really annoys me. And so I absolutely want to get rid of, rid of that. And so that some there's work already to get rid of that. And, because um, ORC has the, the metadata at the bottom of the file, it just has to read the last 30K of each file to, to read the data. And finally, there's a postscript. All the rest of the data is compressed using a gzip or LZO or Snappy. I needed the last little piece to be uncompressed so I could say how the whole file's compressed <laughs> um, you, and how big the, the compressed footer is. So what does each stripe look like? It's got three different pieces. It's got the data section, where all the data for the, the, um, or for the stripe is. It's composed of multiple streams for each file, or each column. So each column can have multiple streams in it, and um, that gives me better compression because it, each stream is compressed together. Um, it has an index. The index is baked into ORC. Um, you can turn it off. You can also change how, how frequently it indexes. By default, every 10,000 rows, it'll create an index entry. So this isn't very big. For most files, it's less than 1% of your total file size. But it means that you have the ability to jump to a particular row very quickly. Um, it also stores the statistics for each of those 10,000 rows. So for each column, you store the min and the max for each section of 10,000 rows, and we'll see why that is important later. Um, and finally, there's a footer at the bottom that gives the, the directory of where each stream is located, and the encoding for each stream. Now, it's important to have the encoding there because we're assuming that um, we want to, to have an extensible set of encodings. Not user extensible, but we want to be able to add additional encodings as, as things develop. So we've got it set up so that the structure is all there, so that we can add additional encodings later. And I'll talk about some of those a little bit later. So this is a picture of what it looks like. 
you have the, the whole big uh, file here with three different stripes. Um, the index data, the row data, and stripe footer for each, um, each of the stripes. If you expand out what the index looks like, you get the index for each of the columns, and equivalently, you get the data exploded by column. And each of the, the data columns actually expands out into multiple streams. And then down at the very bottom, you get the file footer and the postscript. Okay, now we talked about compression, and there's two different pieces of compression with org. The first is a very lightweight compression. This is stuff that's always turned on. You can't turn it off. And it's type specific, and um, the easiest way to think about this is comparing it to RC file. With RC file, an int is always stored as four bytes, because that's how you store, how you serialize um, integers, and longs are always eight bytes, and it, uh, RC file just has to store that data and actually how long it is. With ORC, because I know that this is an integer column, I can take advantage of the fact that, oh, integers often come in runs. Integers often are small rather than large. So I have a, a tighter encoding for small integers. I have a tighter encoding for, for runs, right? All of that is possible because I can understand the data and um, make um, a better encoding. So it's very important that, um, that these lightweight encodings or lightweight compressions are available and can um, compress the data very nicely. But of course, you have to make sure that the encoding is very inexpensive. Finally, after the, the lightweight compression, then you get the, the generic compression. That's Snappy, LZO, or Zlib. And the whole file uses the same compression, okay? So if you have Zlib turned on, it'll compress all of the, the columns um, using the same compression. It's applied to each stream, and it's applied afterwards. Now, now I wanted to deep dive into how the integers are actually compressed. Um, first of all, I use a, a protobuf style variable length integers. This is based on the realization that um, that um, protobuf did one of the first implementations of this out in open source is with the variable length integers. So you use one byte for zero and for small numbers, you use two bytes for, for large numbers, three bytes for even larger and four for if it's very large. Um, then, so that gives you the first level of compression, right? Because you, you get smaller numbers. But then you can also do run length encoding. They fall into two categories. Um, either you've got a run, which is a repeated number, or you've got literals. And you use one bit to, to tell you what you've got. And so you get runs of, or literal runs of 127 length. Um, and the nice feature about this is I can swap back and forth and it looks, if it's doing a literal, for example, if it notices the last couple of values are part of a run, it'll pull them out and make them into a run. And it's very, it's only one byte of overhead as it switches between these, so it's very cheap. Um, I also have to encode the, the present bit stream. So um, I have that and then I have the data stream. Both of those are run length encoded and um, it compresses very tightly. Okay, so that's how you do integers. Now what do strings look like? Strings I encode in dictionaries because often you have low cardinality on your, your strings. And so by making a dictionary, you convert what was a string column into a integer column that has a lot of nice properties. Um, so this increases the, the compression quite a lot, right? Um, the string columns have four streams. Uh, they have the present, which is whether it's null or not, the dictionary data, the dictionary length, and the row data. And all of those are compressed using the, the run length encoding from the, the previous slide. Okay, now we talked about how, how do you encode complex types, and actually it looks like this. So the, the top is the struct, and then you've got the columns underneath, and they've got a tree of writers or readers depending on how you're looking at it. So, so basically when I read a, a row, it reads at the top and then it delegates to the readers that are its children. 
when you're encoding lists, um, it's actually very easy. You just have to encode the, um, the value of how many items are in the list, the same for maps. Now compare this to Parquet, which there was a talk about yesterday. Parquet has, instead of the one value that says how long the list is, for each element in the list, they've got two additional integers, the repetition level and the definition level. So instead of the one int that, that is um, just the length, they've got two ints per value. Obviously, there are some values, some cases where the parquet encoding will be tighter. There are some cases where this will be tighter. It's not clear. Um, no one's actually done the study to, to see how that's gonna turn out. And I'm frankly interested to see how it comes out. I know that the, the Dremel stuff is, is much more complicated, which is why I was like, without a clear benefit, I, I'm not gonna go there. So the generic compression stuff, I've got the, the standard um, compression codex. Uh, I encode everything with a three byte header and I include whether the codec was used or not. So if the codec actually doesn't help things, if it's random data, I just use this, the direct data rather than the larger compressed data and how long it is. I, do, I manage it this way using blocks so that I can jump over it, right? If you remember our C file, they had to decompress the whole column to get to a late value. I can jump over into the middle of a compressed stream because I'm controlling the, the format. Um, and to actually jump into a compressed stream, I need the offset of the start of that compression block and how many bytes after the decompression starts. So given those two numbers, I can jump into a compression stream without having to reset the compression stream itself. Okay, uh, column projection. Column projection is, is a very nice property where you get, you are referencing two of the columns out of your 100, and so you just wanna read those bytes. Obviously with ORC, I've got the directory, so I can say, okay, to read column one, I need these bytes, to read column five, I need those bytes, and so I just schedule the, the reads, and if they're adjacent to each other, I make sure that I collapse the reads into one big read. Um, to make sure that, that it's a very efficient read. How do you use ORC? One of my big concerns was I didn't want this to be very hard to use. I wanted to make this as easy as possible for, for people, and so all you have to do is do your, your create table and then store it as ORC, that's it. If you do that, all your data will get stored as ORC. Um, there are some table properties that you can use to control it. You can use orc.compress, lets you specify what value, how you want to compress the table. Um, the default zlib, you can use none if you don't want any compression, or you can use LZO or Snappy. It also lets you specify org compress size, that's how big the compression block is. Um, the bigger block is the more efficient the compression, but uh, that also means how much data you have to decompress it once you need to look at some of the data. You get to define the orc.stripe size and you get to define how often I store the indexes. Now, one of the things, because we bumped up the memory from four meg to 256 meg, is that if you have a job where you're writing a lot of these files at once, you can run out of memory. Actually, even um, I've had customers who are using Hive and RC file run out of RAM using, using RC file, so with 64 times larger memory footprint, it became very unserious. So I created a memory manager where ORC keeps track of how many files you're writing at once and will scale thing, the memory buffers down for each one. And um, by default, it defaults to 50% of your JVM heap size and that seems to do pretty well. Of course, if you're using a lot of other memory, you should probably scale it down. In the long term, we should make Hive pay better attention to all the, the memory allocations it's using so that it automatically sets these values and is more aware of this situation. But at least this means that you don't have to worry about ORC running out of RAM. Now, of course, that said, the scaling down keeps you from crashing, which is good, but you probably actually do want to make those stripes larger, right? We defined the stripes large to get better efficiency, and so it's actually important that you, you get those. So given that, you probably want to look at setting up MapReduce high RAM jobs 
to get more RAM for your riders if you're into one of these cases where you've got a lot of riders and um, you need to do some RAM. So I took some of the sample data from TPCDS. TPCDS is a standard benchmark that um, is used for doing analysis. The original is text, right? And so I've normalized that to one. The blue and the red are two different data files. If you put it into RC file, it comes down to roughly 60%. If you go down to ORC, it's much smaller. Um, then the following three sets of lines are the gzipped text, the RC file plus zlib, and the ORC with zlib. And yeah, that last line is actually there. It just compressed so small that you can't see it anymore. <laughs> At first I was like, hey, something's wrong. It disappeared. I was like, oh wait, no. <laughs> the, the data actually compresses. It, really, really small, um, one of the dangers of generated data. Okay, so one of the, the features I've just implemented is, which um, is coming in the, in the next version of Hive, is predicate pushdown. Predicate pushdown is the reason that those indexes are, are there. That by storing how to jump to each row and the min and max for each set of columns, I can take a predicate. Let's say you're looking for old people. You want to find everyone who's older than 99. That piece of the, the predicate will get pushed down to the record reader, and the record reader will skip over any sets of 10,000 rows that can't possibly um, match the, the, the predicate. So that means that by using the indexes, you can just skip over large numbers of values. And you can see here's actually two data sets that were run through both at scale 200, scale uh, 1000 for the TPCDS. And um, the blue one is the RC file, the red one is ORC, and the green one is ORC plus the pushdown predicate. And the interesting thing to note here is that ORC is faster than the RC file, but the predicate pushdown is exactly the same size, even though you've got five times as much data. That's because you're looking at the same amount of data, even though the number of data files you had went up a lot between the two. Because you're, you're just selecting and skipping over rows. You had one map that did the same amount of work, and you had more maps that did nothing. <laughs> right, and so you could skip over and the time remained constant. Additional details, uh, all the metadata, not your data, but the metadata is defined in protobuf. That allows me to add new fields without breaking compatibility. That's very important. That it also means that it'll be relatively straightforward to make a C implementation because Protobuf can generate C code just as easily as Java. Um, I, the reader can seek to a given row. That means you can do external indexes. There's a metadata tool that lets you dump out the contents of, of the metadata, uh, which is Hive Service Orc File Dump. User metadata can be added at any point in the writing up until you close the file. And um, ORC files, even though my original goal was to make it work well with Hive, can actually work with PIG or MapReduce using hcatalog, okay? So, so you can actually get to ORC very easily using hcatalog, and that works well. So the current work that's going on for 12, um, oh, actually, I should say, ORC got released as part of 11, so Hive 11 has ORC. The indexes are there, all the features are there. The stuff that's coming in 12, the predicate pushdown is coming in 12. The, um, we're making, actually Facebook has a patch up to make the string columns adaptive. So if you have um, data that is um, not low cardinality but high cardinality, it'll look at the first 100,000 values and decide whether to use a dictionary or direct encoding. Um, Facebook is also working on a patch that'll do the optional directory or optional dictionary for numbers because if you denormalize, often you'll have repeated numbers and so you can get better compression by doing that. And we're working on improved run length encoding. Future work is to support count star, min, max from the metadata so you don't have to read the data at all. Um, improve the interaction with pig. Um, extend the index, uh, do the additional pushdown filters, and allow um, MapReduce to split input stripes, and um, 
actually eventually we'd like to get to the place where the writer can rearrange the rows and because that'll improve compression. Okay, now here's a table. I'm actually gonna skip over this. We've talked about all of it. Um, and I'm gonna hand this over to Eric Hansen. Hey, thanks Owen. All right, so um, I'm a longtime database guy. I worked on in uh, Microsoft and SQL Server team for many years on data warehouse features and was involved in the addition of uh, column store index feature in SQL Server 2012. And uh, we learned in SQL Server 2012 development that there's, there's two key components to a good column store feature. One is a great column store format, and ORC is, is really a, a state-of-the-art column store format that Owen has developed. And um, the next piece is called vectorized query execution. They kind of go together like chocolate and peanut butter. So um, I'm you know, bringing some of that experience to bear. I looked at how we could try to incorporate vectorized query execution into, uh, into Hive to get a, 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 another level of query performance speed up beyond what you could get merely by adding a column store format. So, Really, the column store and vectorization taken together are a technological breakthrough. It's a once in a generation kind of technological breakthrough. Um, it's, you know, it's akin to the switch from you know, a propeller driven aircraft to a jet aircraft or something like that. So uh, this technology is being adopted by a number of different commercial database systems. Um, not all of them have this technology. A lot of the big guys, and I won't name names, don't have it yet. So th this is really pretty state-of-the-art technology that we're moving into Hive. Um, so um, Microsoft and, and Hortonworks have jointly worked together to add vectorized query execution to Hive. It's really um, almost a 50-50 effort so far in the last three, four months. We've, we've, supported, we've implemented support for vectorized execution for single table queries. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how it works. So, um, Conventional database architecture, which has a row at a time iterator model. So that means at the very lowest level of query execution, there's a call made to get next row. And then once you get the row, if you need to apply an arithmetic expression to some of the fields of the row or filter on a few of the columns, you, you t tend to make function calls or method calls to get the values of each column that you need and evaluate the arithmetic expressions and so forth. And um, so that's a very CPU hungry process. And so um, <clears throat> what vectorized query execution does is instead of calling, when you call get next, instead of just getting one row, we'll get a chunk of about a thousand rows and this is called a batch. And a batch is structured so that each column within the batch is held in an array of a primitive data type and this is called a vector. So those arrays will store things like long integers or double precision floating point numbers or strings. And then the, the filter operations and arithmetic operations are performed on arrays of data at a time rather than one row at a time. And it gives us some really good uh, ability to improve efficiency. And I'll show an example of that in a few minutes. So uh, here's a little more detail on why row at a time execution is, is slow. Um, so Hive uses object inspectors to, to get and manipulate field values, and, and they're pretty heavyweight, so that, that isn't really efficient in the current implementation. The inner loop of, of query execution in a row at a time iterator model often has many, call, many method calls, sometimes dynamic method calls um, or virtual function calls, calls to new to allocate new objects. Um, if then else expressions and so forth. And this, this kind of heavyweight logic has some problems. It has a lot of CPU instructions per row. And in addition, because the code's jumping all over the place, it causes the modern query processor, uh, it causes the modern CPU, uh, which has a very deep pipeline, seven stages or even more in some cases, to, to have pipeline stalls, and so the number of cycles it takes to execute each instruction is, is increased because of the pipeline stalls. And uh, the cache locality also isn't so great because you're jumping around through the, the code to execute a lot of different code on the same small piece of data, so the code cache locality is, is not great. And then, um, then you've got to go back and get the next row. 
So the, uh, the solution to this is, as I said, is to do vectorized query execution. Um, so the, uh, this slide that I'm showing here is, is a simplified fragment of code that's doing vectorized execution to do an addition operation to take, to do an, and to add a, a scalar value or a constant to a single column. And the, the key thing is to look at that green text there. So we sort of have, the code is structured to flow everything down to an execution to handle an entire vector, which is 1024 values in a very tight loop of code, which is that green right there. And you'll see that to do an add, we, we take, for a very tight loop, we have an instruction in the body of the loop which just adds one value from the input vector to the scalar and assigns that to an output vector. So that has a lot of benefits. First of all, you notice that the plus sign is the actual Java plus operator. operator. It's not a method call. So there's no interpreter executing the ar arithmetic. So we actually generate a different method for every single operator data type combination using a template expansion at build time. And so this is an example just for the plus operators, say for the integer data type. So uh, <coughs> that, so there's low instruction count. Um, the, the, there's cache locality to 1024 values, which is the size of the vector. There's going to be very few or no pipeline stalls because that code is so regular and so tight. So you'll execute, like you know, the, the instruction processor pipeline will fill up with instructions and boom, boom, they'll be finishing one per clock cycle. And also, um, state-of-the-art compilers can compile a loop like that and actually generate a SIMD instruction for the inner loop so that it will, instead of doing one instruction per element, it'll do one instruction for the whole vector. So uh, the, the Java 8 compiler can actually take a loop like that and generate a SIMD instruction. Now, Hadoop is not close to using Java 8 yet the way I understand it, but in the future, this code could actually compile to generate SIMD instructions and run even faster. So some of the state-of-the-art C compilers and C++ compilers can already do this. Java currently, the currently shipping Java compiler can't quite do it, but it, it's in the works. So the project that, to do vectorization kind of arose, uh, uh, I, I, I knew about vectorized query execution and I, I prototyped it in Java sort of in December, January timeframe and showed it to our colleagues at Hortonworks and, and uh, so we jointly kind of decided it would be a neat thing to, to try to add this to Hive because Hive was, tended to be fairly CPU bound um, for very large queries. So it seemed like a thing that could generate some real near-term benefit for Hive and it wouldn't require completely re-architecting re the process model and memory management and stuff in Hive. Um, so uh, a joint team of, of people from Hortonworks and Microsoft have been working on this for the last four months or so and we rewrote some good large chunks of the engine um, and so now have vectorized query execution code complete for single table queries that involve scans, filters, expressions, and group by aggregate as well as scalar aggregate. So there's aggregates without group by. And so future will probably be, uh, we'll take a look at how to, uh, implementing join operations and broadening out the types of expressions and data types that can use vectorized execution. So some quick performance results. Um, this is not a serious benchmark, but I loaded up 218 million rows of data on my PC and then ran this through Hive. And the interesting thing to note is if you look at, um, so the far lower right corner, it took um, 42 CPU seconds to execute this on ORC, which is uh, the default version of ORC, which does have uh, compression enabled the lightweight compression plus one of the stream compression options enabled. And um, if you look at RC file, non-vectorized with the default, which happens to be uncompressed, it took 381 CPU seconds. So not quite a factor of 10, but we're, so, you know, with ORC and the vectorized execution together, we're getting close to a factor of 10 CPU time reduction. Now the end-to-end -end execution time is not improved uh, by that factor because there's a lot of overhead in MapReduce, but some of the things we're looking at in Tez and other possible extensions to Hive, will be, we'll be able to squeeze a lot of that overhead out of the query execution. So actually only about five or six second burst 
is executing about 100% of the CPU um, to execute that query. So it's theoretically possible we'll be able to get that down to, to, to five seconds or less on a machine like that without, you know, with, with additional effort and re-architecture, but that, that possibility is there. And even within that five seconds, only about a third of the time is spent in the vectorized execution. The other thir another third is MapReduce overhead, and another third is the cost to do the, the, light, the decompression to get data out of ORC and load up the batches of 1,000 rows at a time. So um, there's a lot of potential room for improvement there and getting towards interactive response time. We're already somewhat interactive, like I can sit there and not get bored and not have to walk away from my PC for 42 seconds and we'll get to, to interactive response time. I, I can see it in our future. So I wanna thank everybody who contributed to this uh, in the Microsoft Big Data team, the Hortonworks team, especially Jitendra Pandey, and he and I have sort of been compadres, and I'm, uh, he's the lead on this down at Horton, Hortonworks, and I'm kind of the coordinator and lead up at Microsoft, and we talk on the phone frequently, and we have, you know, so it's been a great collaboration, and I appreciate the work that every, of everybody who's contributed to this. So at this point, we have, we have four minutes for questions. Sorry we didn't leave a full 10-minute allotment, but if you have a question, please come to the microphone and, and we'll do our best to answer. Thanks. Two quick questions. One clarification. When you build an index in Hive 0 0.10, is it on the column strip or in the row, or the whole row? Uh, the index in the org file is um, for, the, for each column. Okay. So um, the next question actually related to that. Does how does the early materialization of the result set or late materialization of the result set? The, I'm sorry, the, qu the question is whether it, it does. The result set materialization equal to early or equal to later? Uh, let's see, Le the result early. set, current, before the vector is, actually, it's the same, it does early materialization. Um, Would it be better if you do late materialization after pushing the predicate down? Oh, sorry. After the, the, I only, if the predicate filters out the whole set of 10,000 rows, then, then I don't read the data. I mean, it, it doesn't it's materialize at all, so it does it late. late. Now, that's only on the, the group of 10,000 rows. It's not on each individual row. One of the things that I'm looking at is doing it also on the row by row basis and how that will play into vectorization. So I'll probably let vectorization get a little closer to, to being ready to check in before I go down that. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for your work and presentation. I was wondering if we could quickly see uh, the comparison matrix <laughs> of the four formats you've shown earlier. Oh, sure. A quick little uh, <laughs> Kodak moment. Oh, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> really, it's going to go on the web. <laughs> uh, currently, the vector, uh, you have implemented, my understanding is that you have uh, made code ready for compiler to recognize it and uh, vectorize it, but it, currently it is not vectorized, right? Right. Uh, so, is it possible to use the JNI to perform the real uh, uh, SMD execution instead of in Java? And uh, w what ex uh, performance do you expect if we use JNI? Um, so, I think you're asking uh, about you know, can you use JNI to like call native code or SIMD instructions yeah. in the inner loop instead of what we did? Yeah. And you know, could could we do that? And how fast would that be? Yeah. Um, I think it it would be. It's con something you could consider, but I don't think it's going to make a, that big a difference. Um, I think that the the SIMD instruction, if you can admit a SIMD instruction. Actually, it, it can make a significant difference. I shouldn't say it wouldn't make that big a difference, but we have other bigger problems to solve before we want to go do that, and that adds quite a bit of complexity to the development effort. Yeah. Like I said, it's already now, it, now vectorized query execution, scans and fil scan, fil you know, so the filter and arithmetic extraction and group by aggregate part of the query execution now is like one third of the total time. Mm -hmm. So we need to squeeze that other two thirds down 
And then we could go back and do the kind of things you suggested and squeeze the remaining third down even further, and then we'd start to notice a big difference. We're, we're having an Amdahl's law kind of effect now, where we're, this is already so fast that making it, <laughs> making it a lot faster might not reduce total execution time by a noticeable amount. Okay, thank you.